Welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero. Continuing on down the other side of the river, we come to the Radvansky Center. So last time we went into the Radvansky Center, this time Ezra taught us a card game. Clara draws a card. Three deep breaths, eight white doves, five slow hours. Kate draws a card. Seven blue petals, three deep breaths, eight white doves, five slow hours. To Kate. What are we listening to? Oh, uh, just a tape a friend of mine sent me. They live in the desert. The sinks? Something like that. Sounds good on the Mammoth's PA. Yeah, that's the only way I listen to anything lately. To Ezra. Your turn, buddy. Ezra draws a card. This is a strange game of cards. Um, nine gray feathers, seven blue petals, three white doves, eight deep breaths, five slow hours. Oh no, it was seven, three, eight. To Ezra. Aw, you're beaten at your own game. I'm just glad it didn't come to my turn again. You took a bullet there, my friend. I was going easy on you. And we're only... Uh, how many cards in now? Five or something? I assume we'll go to 52. Yeah, it's the whole... Actually, no. It goes until everyone forgets a card. I could go on a long time then. Well, not with this crowd, I guess. We're all too soggy brained. I know I am. I even take homemade supplements for it. Shaded, grown lichen boiled with the peel of a lemon, then frozen and crushed with oak leaves. It's a scalp massage oil. You can smell it if I get close. It dries the brain out a bit, which is helpful for a good memory. If I can remember to use it often enough in the first place. I hope you're joking when it says it when you say it drains the brain a bit. That doesn't sound good. You really should not drain brain. <laughs> oh, don't worry. The soggy brain has its benefits too. If your brain is soft and damp, new ideas can make a clear impression, like a boot in wet sand. But like wet sand, it can easily get muddied and washed away. So there's a trade-off, see? It's a shame we can't have it both ways, isn't it? What's this game called, Ezra? Forgetting Game. Now we've arrived next to the grove. So last time I went into the grove with Ezra and Kate. This time, I took a nap. Hey, just a quick one here. I'm gonna shore to some, uh, to do some mushroom hunting. This little island is my favorite spot, and I figured we're already running late. What's one more unscheduled stop? Just need to find Will and get him up here to keep an eye on things. You know, I bet he's asleep. Could you run down and wake him up for me? Bunks are down on the lower level, right next to the map room. Thanks. Playing as Ezra? Yeah. Let's record some sounds.
Such an unnerving noise. There's a kitty cat. That's the one that uh, left the Radvansky Institute, right? <laughs> I can record them sleeping. Oh, a recorded lecture plays from a tape machine next to Will's bunk. And even hinted that he had in mind a design for this device, as recorded in the Diary and Sundry Observations. Reading. Why should personalities in another existence or sphere waste their time working a little triangular piece of wood over a board with certain lettering on it? The whole business seems so childish to me. If we are to make any real progress in psychic investigation, we must do it with scientific apparatus. Again, for Edison, a technical solution to every problem. He goes on to suggest the parameters of the apparatus, and... Uh, yes, a uh, question in the back. James? Indistinguishable. Uh, yes, this idea of personalities lingering after death does appear to be in conflict with Edison's theories about what he called life units. The subatomic entities that animate matter and then scatter to other configurations when a person passes on. But given Edison's emphasis on memory and cognition, remember we're talking about the inventor of the phonograph, and his colorful description of the swarm of interchangeable drone-like, Edison even uses the word proletarian, life units animating the human mind, his theory naturally posits that any individual life unit possesses on its own some fragment of memory. Holy hell, that is... that is a massive sentence. Yeah, this entire thing, this entire thing from up here all the way down here is a single sentence. My god. So, according to Edison, when life units recombine from, say, a soldier into, say, a flower, we may be able, using some apparatus, to coax out from the flower memories of war. The tape stops. Will wakes up. Well, hello, small man. You caught me in my pre-dawn nap. I try to sleep in little nibbles when I can. It maximizes my time in the threshold states. What were you listening to? Well, I used to work at a university, and I'd always eavesdrop on lectures through the ventilation system. Anything and everything. I'm a polymath by nature. Is that how you pronounce that? Polymath? Or is it like, polymath? An old friend recently found this box of tape-recorded lectures next to the dumpster there, and passed them on in the spirit of fondly recalling better days. This one is... Will looks at the label on the tape. History of the Philosophy of Death. Yikes. I play these old taped lectures during my little nibble naps to absorb the inf information more easily. It's pretty effective. I wish I could do everything half asleep. That is... wow, Will is a very interesting person. So they absorb more information when, I guess, they perceive information during the threshold states? I assume that means, like, the state between awake and asleep? That is not the case for me at all. If I listen to something like a podcast while I'm falling asleep, I will remember, like, maybe the first minute or something, and then everything else is just gone. I uh, can't say I learned very much just now, though. I may have been too busy dreaming. 
a vivid narcotic fantasia aboard the... But those are always the quickest to dissipate. I'd better tell you about it now before the spell is broken. Will takes a deep breath, focusing on the task of recalling his dream. I was small. Not a child. Uh, an animal, maybe. I patrolled the corridors of a great iron ship, searching for scraps and... Mice, I think? And crying, always a weak and mournful mew. Wait a minute. Great iron ship. Searching for mice. Crying, mew. They're describing the, uh, what was it called? I forgot the name of the ship, but they're describing that ship full of cats that passed by us in the grove. When we played the, you know, the first time through the Echo River. Huh. Other crewmen slumped in odd corners or lay drunk on the deck. The hall smelled of shame, defeat, and rot gut corn whiskey. They dumped artillery into the water, tore their flags into cloth scraps and made handkerchiefs to bury their sobbing faces. They drifted on Lake Leff, drinking the cold black water and eating eyeless fish. Raw when they at least ran out of cooking fuel, or at last ran out of cooking fuel. They seemed, in their despair, to forget even language. After an interval of years, the ship crossed a threshold into absolute silence. Silence, except for my hopeless, whimpering cry. Anyway, that's all I remember. Lately, I never remember my dreams. Hmm. It's probably for the best. The images of dreams are often wasted on the waking. Well, I've got a stew to start. You may want to hurry back above deck. I believe we're about to pass the bat sanctuary. It's quite a thing to see. Okay, here's an interesting decision. So last time what we picked was Shannon helped me fix up a mushroom stew in the kitchen. However, after doing the mushroom stew, I think it took us to the other option anyway. We helped them with the stew and then we went to deliver the package at the telephone exchange going through the bat sanctuary in the process. So I think probably because that's when Conway is, is taken by the others. They kind of force you to do that, I'm guessing. Um, but let's see if we choose this option at the beginning. Let's see if it's perhaps different. I suspect it won't be. Uh, I do want to do something different though when we're inside of the telephone exchange when Conway's taken. Let's see for a sec though if this is different. This looks the same. Thanks again for your help. Yeah, okay, this is the same. Okay, so this is the moment where I wanted to look more closely at what happened. So this is right when Conway gets taken. So right before this happened, Conway was just over here. Although you couldn't really see much, it was mostly in the dark. But you could see this boat, and I don't think you could see this boat at all. So it's like instant that Conway ends up in this boat. And yeah, there were only two of these outsiders before. And Conway must be the third turning entirely into one of those crystalline strangers. And I remember as they were boating away, there was an option that appeared. And I'm not sure what that option was, but I picked one of the things, and I think it was to, like, look at them as they go. I want to do the other thing and see what happens. Yeah, okay, there it is. So, like, this icon, I think that's the icon for looking at them. That, I'm not sure exactly what that... Is that for Blue? Because I was wondering what happened to Blue, right? I just assumed that Blue went with them. And I think that's the case. Maybe... Because it's pointing to Blue, so I think this means go with them. Blue goes with them, or Blue turns around. And, I guess, stays with Shannon. So, let's pick this go, like, turn around and see if that does what I think it's going to do. Yeah, so I think Blue stays behind. Then I'm, I'm assuming Shannon takes them. Let's see. Actually, I think maybe Blue stays behind at the exchange? It says she returned on the dinghy alone. Just, just like I said before, it doesn't mention Blue. Yeah, this is all the same as before. So Blue stays be behind at the exchange? That's so sad. 
Why? Why wouldn't Shannon take them? I hope they're okay. Oh, we just got back to Sam and Ida's, and Blue's just hanging out here, so I guess they did come with us? Let's talk with them. Shannon scratches Blue behind her ear. She finds a small twig worked into the hair on Blue's neck. Shannon gently tugs the twig free and tosses it into the lake. A twig. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but that makes me feel like perhaps Blue didn't come back on the dinghy, but returned some other way. <laughs> I don't know what that other way could be. Uh, maybe, um, uh, what was that giant hawk's name? Ezra's giant hawk. I think it started with a J. Maybe they took blue back or something. Here we go. So before I chose Junebug and Johnny watched the show from the dockyard with the others. But this time, Ezra stayed on the tugboat to help Clara with her performance. That's a very special tape player you have there. It can play forwards or backwards, slow or fast. You may discover some completely new sounds tonight, Ezra. So, are you ready? Yes. Excellent. Can tell you have a good intuition for sound, and that's very important in this piece. Any questions before we begin? Uh, how do I know what to do? Actually, no. I've got the intuition for this. Nope. Alright. <clears throat> Alright. Let's begin. Cat, mammoth, or sleeping? Mammoth. Ooh. Get a lot of choices. Um, just let it play normally, or I can do slowly at first. Or I can mess with the volume knob. Backwards. Um. Let's play the tape slowly at first, but gradually speed it up.
Thank you, Ezra. Was that okay? Oh, hmm. I don't think I understand your question. I just don't know how to tell if it was good or not. Oh, right. Evaluation. Good music and bad music. I don't like to think about my work that way. Sometimes it's difficult not to. Of course, it's natural to want your art to be good, even if you don't know what that means, but... I try not to be attached to outcomes. Does that make sense? My violin teacher used to tell me to play like a tourist. Act as though you've never been there before. I hope you'll continue making tapes, Ezra. I'm sure there are many more people who would enjoy listening to them, on this river and elsewhere. So it looks like we've reached the end of Act 4 once again. I hope you've enjoyed so far, and I will return soon, at least as soon as Act 5 gets released.